everybody and welcome to episode 19 of Mysteries of the Unexplained. Today I'm your host Wilhelm and on the other line I have... Wilhelmina. Oh, Wilhelm and Wilhelmina. We are the podcasting duo who do uh, delve into mysteries. Yes. We uh, explain the mysteries of the unexplainable, yes? <laughs> I love the way we're slowly going a bit German. <laughs> yeah, like, like by I the totally end of it, we'll be after oh. traveling the world with our accents. <laughs> Annie, Annie Bear, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. You know, we rang you yeah. earlier and I was all like piped yeah. up to 90 and you were like, this will come crashing down. I like this is mm. my cycle during the day. And then we were like, OK, see you later for recording. And you, you rang me there for recording and I was like, yeah, what? And you were like, oh, yeah. do you want to do this? And what are you like, doing? Yeah. What you do? Yeah, come on then. I was just so. I think it's because it's late and I I haven't got my second wind yet. I just have to get my second wind. I'll be fine. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Listen, it's a long old day on you, girl. it's a long old day on you. Um, Very long days, and I find myself at the computer like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, of, and then I can't really sleep that well because I'm all like, oh. So I just ordered myself some blue light glasses which I had before and I lost oh. and I actually missed them because they actually kind of work oh right maybe I should get a pair of those mm. I actually need to get my eyes tested um, because in the night times I go blind as a bat blind as a oh. bat oh. <laughs> that's, that's right a, that's a little bit more severe than me having like yeah. a slight headache and dry eye from the computer screen what oh yeah once the sun goes down evening time I, yeah, I wouldn't, don't put me in a car on the road or I'll run over you <laughs> if you're out walking. Don't do it. Oh, stop the lights. So, yeah, I you need to just, actually get a pair of uh, you dear, were, dear glasses. You were, uh, oh my God, they would be so beautiful, Annie, and you've kind of got her, her neck as well. You are like a heavy <laughs> Ken, I didn't do it. It Ken, wasn't me. <laughs> She's dead now, isn't she? If for yeah, anybody God. who's um, not peace. British or Irish, uh, it's a basically it's a it's a British soap that um, people in Ireland and the UK are obsessed with. And she was a character in it that was um, had massive glasses, and she went down for a crime that she didn't commit, and it was a scandal. Also, it was a at scandal. the time, scandal, and she wore Deirdre those glasses. Rashid. Those eighties kind of glasses that were just yeah. huge, like took over half your face. And I have car to say, window screen. Yeah, car window screen glasses. I have to say, they're, they're kind of a fashion thing that came back in a few years ago, like the huge glasses. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that's I'm true. Not really fe- I'm not really feeling it so much, William. Are you not? Just couldn't pull them off. Oh, that's what I'll be I getting. Spec savers are all good opticians. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, Annie, this week we have a um, we have a podcast promo we do oh. from the fantabulous Amanda and Trevin who host Seriously, Seriously Sinister. Sinister. Oh, you guys. So, yeah. So make sure you go check them out. I'm going to play their promo for you guys right now. Hi, I'm Amanda. And I'm Trevin. We're the hosts of Seriously Sinister, a true petty crime podcast. The show that asks, is that a murder weapon in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? (laughs) We're bringing something new and different to the true crime genre. Each week, we both tell a true petty crime story with high drama and movie-like sound production. Also, get to know us with our weekly dreadful dilemmas and killer facts. Here's a sample of two of our true petty crime stories. Enjoy. As I lay on the floor crying, my vision started to become more clear, and my perpetrator came into focus. A familiar Henri laugh emerged from the man as I recognized his smile. It was my husband. I quickly ripped open the paper and turned to the third page. Earlier in the week, another call had come in. This time a woman had answered the door and got an eye full of mystery fist. The call description... We hope you all enjoyed listening along and aren't too scared to subscribe to our show. You can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. (laughs) 
So make sure you check out um, Seriously Sinister uh, through a pretty time podcast. Again, very spooky. Um, Spooky. Good good luck with your podcast, guys. Nucleids on the block. Um, And thanks for sending that over to us, you guys. And best of luck. Best of luck is right. Now, you guys, you have come here for spooky stories and I have a few spooky stories for you this week so I do these stories are a collection by John Seymour um, from a book that he wrote in 1914 which was called Annie can you guess what it is ghost stories (laughs) close Annie but not quite there today it's a a book called True Irish Ghost Stories, um, originally done in 1914, and John Seymour and Larry L. Neeligan wrote it. But then later on, appeared um, Larry was gone and it was literally just John <laughs> took over and claimed he wrote the book. So we'll leave it with John. Um, um, Larry, Larry met an unfortunate end, did he? And I would just like to say that I did guess. My my guess was actually in the title of the book. So I I get full points for that. Ah, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> you're like Listen. you're you're just like appease the beast, appease the beast, throw yeah. a bit of meat, appease it. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay, continue. Now, um John Draley Court Seymour is his f- Draylen Court Seymour so apologies don't kill me from the grave John <laughs> um, was an Irish Anglican priest um, he was born in the f- on the 15th of April in 1880 um, and in the first half of the 20th century who he served as Arch- Archdeacon of Cl- Cashel and Emily which I don't know where Emily is in Ireland do you? Where is Emily, it's probably one of I those things like ossery. It's it's like an old, um, you know, it's it's a like a church name given to like a diocese, and nobody else knows what they're fucking talking about. Yeah, maybe he was born in Limerick in Ireland, and he was educated in Trinity College in Dublin, and he was ordained in 1904. And he actually went on and wrote a, a second book as well, um, which is Irish Witchcraft and Demons. <laughs> So he obviously <laughs> had a bit of an interest in are this you area. This guy was a priest because I don't think that they're meant to be into this shit. Well, this fellow was, so Oh. Renegade. Okay. I like him. <laughs> I shall I shall now read from said book. There is something so natural and at the same time so unnatural in seeing a door open when we know that no human hand rests on the knob or in hearing the sound of footsteps, light or heavy, and feeling that it cannot be attributed to the feet of a mortal man or woman. Or perhaps a form appears in a room, standing, sitting or walking, in fact, situated in its three dimensions, apparently as an ordinary being of flesh and blood, until it proves its unearthly nature by vanishing before our astonished eyes. Now, John goes on a bit here now, so bear with me, guys. We just have to give you this intro, right? (laughs) Or perhaps we are asleep in bed. The room is shrouded in darkness. And our recumbent attitude, together with the weight of bedclothes, hampers our movements and probably makes us more cowardly. A man will meet pain or danger boldly if he be standing upright, occupying the erect position which is his as lord of creation but his courage does not well so high if he be sabine we are awakened suddenly by the feel that some superhuman presence is in the room we are transfixed with terror we cannot find either the bell rope or the matches (laughs) because we didn't have electricity back in this time you see I can't find the bell rope or the mattress to so get the blooming thing working. This fella is talking a load of bollocks and there better be yeah. a ghost in here somewhere. 
he I think John is one of those people that you know when he's just like I'm just going to do some writing and then he puts the pen to the paper and he's just like I went down the stairs with an awful <laughs> follow and my filly folly steps I couldn't believe my legs were working as I realised then I had two legs one went in front of the other left and right I was astonished to notice I don't had hands do you know this type of character yeah it's sure. like John come on with it if you're sitting yeah, beside like, him at a fucking dinner party you'd be like oh yeah. Jesus and he starts to tell a story and then like two hours later he's basically just told you that he put his jacket on do you know like you haven't <laughs> you're like for fuck's sake where are the shots where are the shots you're like can't dine for a fag even though you gave up fag 10 years ago you're like give me a fucking smoke now would drive can't, you back to smoke and drive you back to yeah, smoking just to get certain, out of the room searching the table trying to make eye contact with somebody to be like hi are you go- you're going to the toilet do you want me to hold your knickers for you I'll go with you yeah no problem come on do you know just get out of it but anyway while we dare not to leap out of the bed and make a rush for the door least we should encounter we know not what in an agony of fear we feel it moving towards us it approaches closer and yet closer to the bed and for what may or may not then happen we must refer our readers to the pages of this book we must now turn (laughs) these stories I'm sorry I guess we must now turn to the subject of this chapter Mrs G Kelly a lady well known in musical circles in Dublin sends as her own personal experience the following tale of a most quite haunting in which the spectral charwoman does not seem to have entirely laid aside all her mundane habits. I will now embody Mrs G. Kelly. (laughs) My first encounter with a ghost occurred about 20 years ago. On that occasion I was standing in the kitchen of my house in blank square. They seem to for some reason not want to say the square. Like he, a lot of stuff goes on in this square in Dublin and it's North Dublin. What square would that be? Marion Square? They didn't want to no. identify her. Um, well, yeah. It's well, not Marion Square. She, That's not in Dor- she, Um, No, it's not, William. Anyway. William, I do yeah. think that you might be talking a load of shite, but I would let you continue. What do you mean? I'm only joking. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> why does this why why does this woman have an English accent? Do you know what? I'm just gonna go. With, I'm gonna go with it. Let's go. Because do, oh, do you know what? I'm glad you asked that because Irish women back in the heyday talked with an English tan twang. Oh, did they? Well, they did if they were very fancy and rich and if she yeah. in a square in Dublin. Maybe she was. So she's I do fancy. take it back. You're, you're right. She's a fancy. Z- woman. I am very accurate in my accents. <laughs> On that occasion, I was standing in the kitchen of my house in Blank Square when a woman, whom I was afterwards to see many times, walked down the stairs into the room. Having heard the footsteps outside, I was not in the least perturbed, but turned to look who it was and found myself looking at a tall, stout, elderly woman wearing a bonnet and an old-fashioned mantle. She had grey hair and a benign and amiable expression. We stood gazing at each other while one count to twenty. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> At first I was not at all frightened, but gradually, as I stood looking at her, an uncomfortable feeling increasing to terror came over me. This caused me to retreat farther and farther back, until I had my back against the wall, and then the apparition slowly faded. This feeling of terror, due perhaps to the unexpectedness of her, of her appearance, always overcame me on the subsequent occasions when which I saw her. These occasions numbered 12 or 15. (laughs) I'm not sure. It was 12 or 15 times. 12 or 15. I have seen her in every room in the house and at every hour of the day during a period of about 10 years. Are you sure she doesn't fucking live there? (laughs) Are you living in somebody else's house, maybe, and you're, like, in the wrong place? 
<laughs> I feel like Mrs. Kelly, right, was really wealthy, lost it all and had to like, get a housemate and was just like, this woman is yeah, living in my like, house. Yeah, she was like in total denial. And if anybody, if anybody was like, oh, I've met your lodger, she'd be like, oh, I don't have a lodger. I'm a woman of means. I, I, I genuinely think that that's what's happened to this woman. The last time she appeared was 10 years ago. My husband and I just returned from a concert at which he had been singing and we sat for some time over supper talking about the events of the evening. When at last I rose to leave the room and opened the dining room door, I found my old lady standing on the mat outside with her head bent towards the door in the attitude of listening. So she's a nosy ghost. <laughs> nosy bitch first. of a ghost. <laughs> and, and, and like, sorry, if you're a ghost, why do you have yeah. to stand outside the door listening? Can you not just flow through it and be invisible? No. That's why I think it was a housemate. <laughs> I just think it was a woman who was living there. <laughs> <laughs> I called out loudly and my husband rushed to my side. That was the last time I have seen her. One peculiarity of this spectral visitant was a strong objection to disorder or untidiness of any kind, or even an or even to an alteration in the general routine of the house. For instance, she showed her disapproval of any stranger coming to sleep by turning the chair's face downwards on the floor in the room they were to occupy. I well remember one of our guests having gone to his room one evening for something he had forgotten, remarking on coming downstairs again, well, you people have an extraordinary manner of arranging your furniture. I have nearly broken my bones over one of the bedroom chairs, which was turned down on the floor. As my husband and I restored that chair twice already to its proper position during the day, we were not much surprised at his remarks, although we did not enlighten him. The whole family have been disturbed by a peculiar knocking, which occurred in various rooms in the house, frequently on the door or wall, but sometimes on the furniture, quite close to where we had been sitting. This was evidently loud enough to be heard in the next house, for our next door neighbour once asked my husband why he selected such curious hours for hanging his pictures. Another strange and fairly frequent occurrence was the following. I had got a set of skunk furs which I fancied had an unpleasant odour, as this fur sometimes does, and at night I used to take it from my wardrobe and lay it on a chair in the drawing room, which was next to my bedroom. The first time that I did this, on going to the drawing room, I found, to my surprise, my muff in one corner and my stole in another. Not for a moment suspecting a supernatural agent, I asked my servant about it, and she assured me that she had not been in the room that morning, whereupon I determined to test the matter, which I did by putting in the furs late at night and taking care that I was the first to enter the room in the morning. I invariably found that they had been disturbed. That is Mrs. G. <laughs> Kelly's experience with her ghost. Now, let me show you. Oh, my muff was in one corner and my stole in another. <laughs> you dirty old bitch. <laughs> um, st- it's Dublin is a scary place. It did remind me of our, our when we lived together. Now, we did mention this before on the podcast and how in the house that we both lived in in Dublin there was that knocking on the wa- in the walls and Literally in the ceilings just, in the night I was thinking about that the whole time that yeah, you were when saying I read that, that I story that. and I can't yeah. believe that I was so like stu- like don- stupid for a while that I like the first few months I lived there I was just like oh like the neighbours are really noisy like oh and then like, I remember lying there as well, being like, what a time of night to be moving furniture about, because that's what it fucking sounded like. And then yeah. I realised that there was no neighbours upstairs and there was just a roof over me. And if it had been some type of animal, it is a fucking huge one. No, it's not, because it wasn't animal noises. It was like furniture banging uh, footstep mm. noises. And um, yeah, it was very bizarre. 
Very bizarre. Totally bizarre. Like, to- and do you know what? It felt, that noise felt like it was coming from inside the house still. Like, even, th- like, it yeah. wasn't coming from the house next door. And they were old, really old, thick walled houses as well, and the terrace that we lived in. Totally weird. I kind of believe it. Although, something about G. Kelly makes me think that she was hitting the gin fairly hard as well. She's like, oh, I yeah. asked my servant. Maybe she had two servants and forgot that she had employed one of them. I did for some reason get drinker as well. I don't know why. Mm. And we are psychic, so this is awkward. <laughs> now, I do have one more story if you'd like to Go hear on. it. Go on, I want another one. Yeah, do it. And again, comes from um, comes from uh, the, a square in North Dublin. So is it the same square? We'll never know. Fucking hell. A most weird experience fell to the lot of Major McGregor. He says... In the end of 1871, I went over to Ireland to visit a relative living in a square in the north side of Dublin. In January 1872, the husband of my relative fell ill. I sat up with him for several nights, and at last, as he seemed better, I went to bed and directed the footman to call me if anything went wrong. I soon fell asleep, but some time after I was awakened by a push on my left shoulder. I started up and said, Is there anything wrong? I got no answer, but immediately received another push. I got annoyed and said, Can you not speak, man? And tell me if there is anything wrong. Still no answer. And I had a feeling I was going to get another push, when I suddenly turned around and caught a human hand, warm, plump and soft. I said, Who are you? But I got no answer. I then tried to pull the person toward me, but I could not do so. I then said, I will know who you are. And having the hand tight in my right hand, with my left, I felt the wrist and arm enclosed. As it seemed to me in a tight fitting sleeve of some winter material with a linen cuff. But when I got to the elbow, all trace of an arm ceased. I was so astounded that I let the hand go and just then the clock struck two. Including the mistress of the house, there were five females in the establishment. I can assert that the hand belonged to none of them. When I reported the adventure, the servants exclaimed, Oh, it must be the master's old Aunt Betty who lived... (laughs) She had a very masculine hand. <laughs> Our Aunt Betty, who lived for many years in the upper part of the house and had died over 50 years before at a great age. I afterwards heard that the room in which I felt the hand had been considered haunted and very curious noises and peculiar incidences occurred, such as the bedclothes torn off and etc., one lady got a slap in the face from an invisible <laughs> hand. <laughs> Betty is a little bitch. And when she lit her candle, she saw as if something opaque fell or fell or jumped off the bed. A general officer, a brother of the lady, slept there two nights, but preferred to go to a hotel to remaining the third night. Okay. He never would say what he heard or saw, but always said the room was uncanny. I slept for months in the room afterwards and was never disturbed in the least. Very fucking. I tell you one thing, I wouldn't be fucking. I I I tell you one thing, I wouldn't be. I tell you one thing is right. Betty and Betty is a little bitch. Something, something is telling me that I have told this story before, <laughs> that I really? might have, I, I might have found it. I either researched it for the the podcast, or it has now. It might have been a Patreon episode, but the minute she slapped your one in the face, I was like, I know that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Aunt Betty strikes again. <laughs> William's retelling of a story done by Annie, possibly, we're not sure. Sh- show, show us how much she listened to me. 
I was asleep for that episode. I had a cardboard cut out of the microphone. Um, oh, sorry about that, Oh Joan. my God. No, not at all. I mightn't have told it, but I definitely, maybe I just read it when I was researching before. But I remember well, like the pro- hand. I remember the hand and the slap in the face, but maybe it was, a pa- it might have been a Patreon episode. <laughs> Uh, this book is so funny because there is like uh, different chapters in it. So that that, that that particular one that I read from was um, Haunted Houses in or near Dublin. And then there's other um, chapters on poltergeists, all Irish related. So we'll get uh, we'll get a bit of we'll get a bit of our money's worth out of this, guys. Absolutely. And, then, and um, a few of you had been asking for more Irish stories anyway. I love yeah. the Irish stories. And I just want to say, right house prices yeah. in Dublin are like one of the highest in the fucking world at the moment and you are paying that much money apparently on the north side of Dublin anyway to get a free ghost in your house like imagine paying all that money and then some little bitch comes in knocking over your furniture turning the furniture upside down and slapping you in the face you'd be like oh I just paid I just paid half a million for this two bedroom apartment and now I can't leave because Aunt Betty comes in and slaps me around the place in the middle of the night <laughs> well guys if you want to hear more um of these uh haunted houses in dublin at the turn of the century stories <laughs> you can do so because i'm gonna do um i'm gonna do a little uh, follow-on episode of this on our patreon oh. and there's one particular story that was a literal madhouse that anybody that went to uh live there or buy the house turned mental oh. and there was one woman that was that was discovered by a guard uh, as he was out on his patrol hanging from the windowsill because she had gone do lally uh, so head over to Patreon if you want to uh, listen to that I uh, I hope you liked those little stories there now I today. really that enjoyed them might have been a repeat you're um, really after actually um, cheering me up there now I'm in a better mood and um, speaking of Patreon actually we are going to be doing a little live stream for Patreons only oh, yes. next week uh, Friday the 7th of May oh my god is that next week already Will? That's next Friday, Annie. Yep. Holy moly cannoli. Yeah, we're going to be doing a little live stream there. So uh, make sure you guys check it out and keep an eye on the Instagram and on the Facebook page because we will get you a certain time of the day that is suitable for our friends across the seas. Anyways. Now, Annie, it is that time of the show where we <gasps> are going to ask you some questions, Annie. Oh my God. Are Here we go. Roll the tape. I think, I think you're going to be glad that it's the Annie that um, it's the Annie from now and not 20 minutes ago because I think I'm in yeah. a better place. She's in a better place now. Mm-hmm. Roisin, if you could press the pre- with the roll for Ask Annie, please. Ask Annie anything. I like that one actually. I like that oh one. God. That one's a bit different. So low energy, not me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, what mythical creature would improve the world most if it had existed? In your opinion. If it had existed, which would improve the world the most? I kind of want, I'm kind of tending towards the unicorns and I don't know why. Maybe it's because kitties love them so much and mm. they're like all, all little kids are like unicorn mad at the moment or all the ones I know and then like if they were real they'd be but then if they were fucking real then they'd just be like oh that's a horse with a horn in the middle of his head like I feel like these things are only so loved because they're not real do you know what I mean do you know what I mean I'm getting very existential about the thing like you know um, I don't know like they're not very helpful mythical creatures like a yeti what like what's it going to do for you a unicorn what's it going to do for you really like you know the Loch Ness Monster I mean what's it really going to do for you like are any of these like can you put them to work can they be like servants can they work in IT I don't know I'd have to know I'd have to see their TV <laughs> William <laughs> so you're telling me that you can't name one yeah, that's exactly that's what I'm telling you. That's no problem. Vacant is what I described <laughs> as being. Our next question, Annie, is if someone asked to be your apprentice and learn all that you know, what would you teach them? 
I'd teach them that on how to be a chancer <laughs> next <laughs> how to be an absolute chancer ch- what do you mean by, what do you mean by that chancer you're a chancer <laughs> no I would I would um, tell them on one woe begone night back in the fucking late uh, 2000s not to answer the call to a house party Oh, that wasn't late 2000s. Oh no, edit that bit out. I don't know what I'm saying. I would tell them you're never rambling. to rambling. I would never. I tell them never to become friends with you, number one, because your life could have went on on <laughs> the like could have went uphill instead of fucking downhill quite quickly after I got involved with the likes of you. I would tell them that um um don't smoke any fags. And I would tell them, you know, like just start an exercise regime when you're younger. It will stand to you. But like all, all the stuff that I've learned across the way and all the magical things that I've done, I wouldn't change a thing. I would tell them to that they needed to scrub all those toilets and clean up all that vomit. Uh, something tells me that this apprentice is number one, not getting paid at all. <laughs> well, Secondly, I barely got paid, so they're not getting paid. <laughs> Secondly, they're going to be your skivvy and will have to be like washed, scrubbing your toilet. And thirdly, you'd be an absolute witch to them. Now, we're moving on to the third and final question that I have for you today. And it is, Annie, if you were transported 400 years into the past with no clothes or anything else, how, Annie, would you prove that you were from the future? I'd show them a really bad tattoo from the circa 1990s that has a strange, relem- a strange resemblance to something that um, once adorned the body of a Baywatch superstar, and I will absolutely say no more about that matter. And Mel C from the Spice Girls. Put it together, guys. Put it together. <laughs> Annie, wait there. Hold on. Turn on the news. There's something on the fucking news. <laughs> Hold on. What's going on? What's going on? Turn on. Oh my goodness. Oh my. What? Wait, no, what? Turn it up. No, turn it up. Not that button. The other button. Turn it off. Oh God. A mysterious vampire beast has killed 50 livestock by sucking their blood dry, leaving farmers terrified it could be the legendary Chubacabra, reports claim. Officials and vets in northern Chile are said to have been baffled after dozens of baby llamas and alpacas were found with puncture wounds in their chests. The injuries did not match those made by usual predators such as pumas and foxes, which normally go for the neck, experts said. Farmers claimed the creature only attacks at night and does not leave any footprints to help identify or track it, further adding to local panic. Some believe that this could be the mythical chubacabra, which is said to suck the blood from goats, cows and horses. Around 50 llama and alpaca corpses have been reported since November around the village of Clocane near the border of Bolivia. Clocane Mayor Javier Garcia Coquec was also was so worried he hired a vet to study the remains and Chile's National Agricultural and Livestock Service has now said start mm, has now started an investigation to help solve the riddle Annie. Andrea Nito, the local veterinarian surgeon, called in to examine the corpses, could not determine what had killed them. She said they are not the marks of predators from here, such as the puma or the fox. Only two perforations are seen at the thorax and nothing else. Apparently from there the animal is sucked but a more exhaustive investigation is necessary. Her report ruled out an attack by wild dogs which ripped their prey which ripped their prey apart and also ruled out the possibility of bats. She said, from the bite I can conclude that this is an animal with a small jaw due to the size of its fangs which are very advanced unlike other predators that have them more to their sides. The mayor even said, Given the concerns of neighbours, we will deliver all the information to the SAG so that they can conclude what type of animal it is and how to contain it. Annie Gan, what were you doing in Chile? 
<laughs> well, were you up to on your met? Mm. You're on a mess. Come down, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I just had an awful hankering for meat. Oh, isn't it weird that I was sadder when I heard they were llamas than when I heard they were it was cattle? Like that's you know when I when I heard yeah. it was llamas and I'm back and I was like, oh no! But I like, know I mean, they're so cute. I know, but so are cows. Don't eat any of them. Do you know what it mm. is? It what? was the Car- it was the Kardashians on their summer holidays. What? How did you come to that, that conclusion? They're because vampires. they're so they're so hungry. They're so hungry from starving themselves for the paparazzi that they just got down there and um they get a bit loose and they get a little bit loose with it and start drinking a little bit and kind of partying and stuff and then like they realize how hungry they are and then they let they let them loose in a field of llamas because nobody's going to mind down in Bolivia like what you do, do you know? And then they just fly them back to the states and they 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 post on their Instagram pictures of them with vampire facials. Where do you think the blood is coming from? Okay, and he's clearly lost it, everybody. <laughs> so, on that note, we will come to conclude our podcast. Guys, can we actually ask you guys, if you haven't done so already, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you can do so on your pod- uh, podcast platform as it really helps the show. And we shall read them out for you guys live on air. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to keep an eye out for our live stream next week. Oh, yes. And uh, Will, where else can the people find us, William? Um, well, you can get bonus episodes on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash mysteries of the unexplained. You can follow us on Instagram at uh, mysteries of the unexplained pod. And we also have a Facebook super duper group which is mysteries of the unexplained um where we uh have lols every day the lols every day thank you guys thanks so much but until next week join us for more mysteries of the unexplained wherever Whenever we're meant to be together We're meant to be together I'm in